afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we are joined by Jen Rohde and Renee Susami of Henry Schein's Integrated Design Studio, who will be discussing infectious disease control through design. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will cover them at the conclusion of the webinar. No CE credits are being offered for viewing this presentation. Disease control is certainly on everyone's mind right now, so let's get right to it. Jen, take it away. All right, well, thanks, Adam. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. Before we dig into our subject, we'd, we'd like to share some background on ourselves and introduce you to our team. So once again, I'm Jen Rohde. I manage our integrated design studio. Um, I have been with Henry Schein for just over 22 years, um, and my experience is in architecture and in construction. With me today is Renee Sasami, and I'll let her do her own intro. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Um, again, my name is Renee Sasami. I'm a lead interior designer with Henry Schein's Integrated Design Studio, and I have been with Henry, Henry Schein for a little over six years, and prior to joining the team, my background is in the commercial furniture world, senior living design, and also residential design. Great, thanks Renee. So just a quick look at our team. Um, as you can see here, we have 20 designers that specialize in dental office design. So this is a snapshot of Integrated Design Studio, which is part of Henry Schein. We are based out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, working in coordination with our equipment specialists throughout the US. Our services go anywhere from dental space planning, 3D visualization, equipment and technology specification, and also interior design. Today's intent is really to provide recommendations for both existing and new offices that we really believe will promote safety and confidence for patients and staff. Good design should really support practice efficiency, patient satisfaction, and of course, future needs. When these are achieved, we, we really believe that it paves the way for increased infection control. I do wanna make mention that the information we're sharing with you today is solely based on our recommendations and should not be viewed as requirements. We've utilized a lot of resources over the past few months um, to um, really reference the information we're gonna to share today. As we all know, safety has been a priority in the dental environment. This isn't, it, it's always been a priority. This isn't new news. But based, based on the increased awareness around infection control, many have adopted added safety measures, including sanitation spaces throughout the area, PPE, air purification, and aerosol containment. If you're looking to take it a step further, you can also incorporate infection control into your design. So let's take a closer look. Here's an example of a layout that we've created with a few things in mind. One, we're always looking at the functionality of the space. I think everyone at, at first glance, you can clearly see that there's good circulation around the space. Um, so also what we're taking into account as we develop this space is we wanna make sure that we're thinking about infection control throughout and how we can really improve that. Now let's, let's keep in mind that our theory behind dental office design has, has really has not changed. Um, instead of reacting to current news, we've really taken this as an opportunity to make small adjustments while also improving the overall function and flow of the dental space. So when we're approaching a design, we break the space into three segments. Your public space, clinical, and your private zone. By doing so, we provide separation between patient and private spaces, while you can also see that we're reducing the traffic throughout the space. If we take a closer look at the, the private zone here, you can see that it's well divided, tucked off to the side, it's out of sight from patients. And, and in this area, what you can see, you have your private office, your staff areas, mechanicals, but we've also kept it closely connected to the clinical space. So we do wanna make sure that there's a nice connection between the two zones so that staff can remove, or so that staff can move from space to space. If you take a look at the clinical space here, you can see that we've aligned the treatment rooms around the perimeter. We place sterilization in a very central location, making it easy for staff management or staff or instrument management, um, an easy in and out flow here. 
Also, just a, a good rule of thumb in, in any scenario, um, when we're locating sterilization, we want to make sure that we keep a max distance of 30 feet. Um, so just an important thing to remember. As we move to the front of the space, this encompasses our public zone. So that's going to include your reception, your waiting space, patient restrooms, checkout, and your consultation. So we're going to take a little bit closer look at each of these zones and, and dig in a little bit further on things that you can think about within each of these spaces. But before, that, before we do that, we just kind of want to take a, a high level look at the space. So as you can see here, once again, we're taking a look at the, the circulation of the space. If we start at this main entry point where our patients are going to be entering the space, they're coming in this main entry, they're easily able to check in and then step off to the side and wait in the waiting until their treatment. Once they move back into the treatment space, they're heading out this door that is designated for an entry. They're coming around the corner, passing by the imaging area if they need to take an x-ray, and then directly into the treatment space. Once they finish their treatment, they're gonna head back out to the secondary hallway here. They have an easy spot here to check out, step off the hallway, and then exit the space. So the key focus here on what we're really trying to achieve is trying to create that one-way flow all the way through the office and really eliminate the need for patients to cross paths along the way. So now that we've kind of taken a look, uh, kind of a high level, how we want to organize a space, the function and flow to it, we really want to kind of take a closer look to each of those zones and some things that we want to think about within each of those spaces. So I'm going to pass it off to Renee, who's going to dig in a little bit more on the public zone. Renee? Thanks, Jen. So taking a look at the public zone, um, our first space, oh, Jen, could you hit for the next slide? Thank you. Um, so Jen did that high level look of uh, the patient path of travel. So the first stop is gonna be our patient entry um, reception and check-in. You know, right now, if you currently have a dental office, you might be utilizing virtual check-in and waiting. If you're thinking about building a new dental practice, you might be questioning whether or not you want to incorporate a reception area or a waiting room. And our recommendation to that question is yes. Um, it's always key to have a waiting room area and also a check-in with a greeter for your patients um, to stop at. A couple things you might want to consider, though, um, some recommendations that we do have is to incorporate an optional check-in kiosk. Here we've been added one to the left of our reception desk. We also would really highly recommend incorporating clear partitions to just separate the patient and the greeter. Um, this just aids in um, staff confidence as well as patient confidence. Lastly, incorporating hand washing or sanitation stations throughout that um, entry point is really critical as well. And here's an example of a product by ADAC. It is the Protect and Sanitize Station. I think it's a really great unit because um, it can be easily incorporated into an existing space, be, be it that it's small and compact, but it still offers all the necessities that you need from the trash receptacle to the hand pumps, um, sand, um, Sanitizer, thank you. <laughs> I think the biggest message that I wanna send home is regardless of your check-in method now or in the future, you still want that entry to make a great first impression. Um, this is where patients are gonna decide if they wanna continue seeing you. Um, it's where they're going to have the most anxiety when they walk into your space. So having a space that's warm and welcoming is key. You know, a couple of things I want to showcase in this image on the right. Um, we have incorporated the divider panels at the reception desk. Again, you can see they're clear. The greeter has a direct view to that patient walking in. They also have a direct view to any patient sitting in that waiting room. We've incorporated the use of a lot of high-end finishes throughout the space as well, from luxury vinyl tile, um, carpet tiles, the use of quartz on the front face of that reception desk and transaction counter, as well as decorative lighting fixtures. And overall, the space just has a very warm and welcoming, inviting color palette. So one question that I feel I've always been asked while working at Henry Schein Integrated Design Studio and more so recently is what should my waiting room sizing be? 
Our rule of thumb has always been one and a half to two chairs per treatment room is our standard recommendation. Now that number might vary depending on if you're a specialty or not. Um, one thing I really recommend considering though, and this is something that's been trending for a while, um, and I think now with infection control, it's even more critical, is to have your waiting room incorporate pieces that are flexible with smaller groupings, um, grouping configurations, as opposed to the long banks of side-by-side -side seating that were so commonly seen in a clinical environment. Something else that's also been trending is booth style seating or even incorporating in a large waiting room, adding some freestanding privacy panels to help divide that space and make smaller grouping areas. You know, one tip that we do recommend is just proper scheduling. You know, adding additional time in between your patients will really help reduce the number of patients waiting in that waiting room. So when you start getting down to the nitty gritty, you figured out the size of your waiting room and now you really need to analyze what type of furniture pieces and layout are you going to put into your space. We really recommend connecting with a commercial furniture dealership. Um, they can really help you optimize the use of your space, um, not only optimize the use of your space, but help you analyze your demographic. Is 50% of your patient base family? Are you seeing 90% adults? That's gonna really help dictate what styles of seating are gonna work best. Henry Schein Integrated Design Studio is partnered with Corporate Design Interiors. They are a local furniture vendor out of the Milwaukee area, um, and they are a great resource to us. Um, we've been working with them for a long time, and again, one of the benefits of working with a commercial furniture dealership is the wide range of vendors. We see that they have over, I believe, 200 vendors that they have access to that offer a different array of styles and budgets. Um, one of the biggest, I think, benefits of working with CDI or any commercial furniture vendor is the facilitation of delivery. Being that we're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we still service all 50 states. So recently, we actually completed an installation in Hawaii during the midst of a hurricane, and CDI was able to deliver on that delivery, have expert installers, and deal with all the post-installation um, customer service needs that may come. So in preparation for this presentation, we collaborated with CDI and just wanted to come up with a couple of different scenarios on our sample plan and how furniture could really um, possibly retrofit an existing waiting room. So this is option one. So this sample is really showcasing an existing space and some simple tips and tricks you could use to incorporate into that space. So the first image that we want to discuss is that business office. So here we're showing freestanding movable glass partition panels. So this is something that can be easily added in and out as needed. Um, but again, we still have direct line of sight to that reader. They look nice and clean. Over on the left, our floor plan has two small workstations. And I do think as a designer, it's I always recommend to any dentist I work with to offer varied seating in their space. So the workstations have been something that's been popular for a while. But how do we deal with that with infectious control? So in this scenario, we've incorporated a simple removable glass panel to help divide those two seating areas. Moving down to the two other images, we have our more standard, typical um, waiting room furniture with some side chairs, some sofas, but again, to divide that space to help prevent infection control, we've incorporated a movable glass partition. So again, this is just showing an example of some simple tricks you can do with an existing office um, that you can add in small pieces to really um, help provide confidence with those patients waiting in that waiting room. So scenario two is taking a little bit of a different approach. So here we've implemented some more fixed solutions and we've made these solutions really part of the design aesthetic of the waiting room. So starting again at the top with our business office, um, we've incorporated a fixed um, partition panel. So this would be something that would be actually installed on the top of that transaction counter. Still again, offering you flexibility to remove it, but it's a more permanent solution. Moving to our workstation, we still have two separate workstations, but to help divide that space, we've actually built a wall and then incorporated, incorporated a, um, like a resin-based partition panel for additional privacy. Going down to the two other images, we still have a division of space from the right and the left, but here we've incorporated a fixed half wall, we've incorporated some plants and some greenery, bringing in a, a biophilic design element, and I think overall we just have a little bit more of a modern aesthetic to this layout. So again, whether you're building new or you are 
trying to retrofit, I think furniture offers some great solutions to help divide your space. So taking a step back to our overall reception and business office, um, Jen touched on kind of the flow of patients. And, you know, just to reiterate, what we wanted to achieve in the sample plan um, to really show ways you can improve infection control is to create an in and out flow around that business desk. So as you can see here, you know, patients, when they enter through those double doors, they then are taken through a patient entry that is only used for patient entry. They then go into treatment. When they come back down from treatment, they then go past a private exit hallway, which includes two semi, a semi-private checkout station as well as just a standard checkout station. Um, with this plan, we've incorporated wider hallways. Um, this will really help with the crossing paths of patients. Um, another thing to consider too is in this plan, we've actually incorporated two checkout stations. And you'll notice the first checkout station is that semi-private che checkout station. It's recessed back. This is a great solution for possibly if you're not doing chair side consultation or not scheduling those future appointments chair side, you can utilize the space for longer conversations. But then we still have a secondary checkout for those that you know just need to do a quick appointment or make a pick, quick payment. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, scheduling future appointments can be done chair side, consultation can be done chair side. This will really help aid in not having a long line of people um, waiting to check out. Um, however, we do understand that longer conversations need to happen. So allocating space in your floor plan for an actual consultation room is beneficial as well. Um, one thing we did incorporate in this plan is we wanted to limit the amount of patients that don't need clinical care, but might still need to access that business office, um, a direct path of travel. So here we incorporated a sliding barn door from that waiting room to get across to the hallway to consult. Lastly, we just incorporated an additional um, sanitation station at exit. So passing it back over to Jen for clinical zone. All right, thanks Renee. Um, so moving into the clinical zone, we'll start by taking a look at the treatment spaces. Uh, starting with the open treatment area, if you're, if you're planning on putting in a hygiene bay or an ortho bay, or you're looking at retrofitting an existing office, we would always recommend to keep six feet between those two chairs arm to arm. Creating a spacious bay will also provide better circulation and function within, within this space. So even if you're able to add more than six feet and space allows, um, it's a great opportunity to kind of open up the functionality of that space. If you're looking to create more privacy and protection, you may want to consider placing privacy panels between the chairs. I think we saw an example in the, the waiting area of some of those panels. There's all kinds of different types that you're going to see later in the presentation with Renee. Um, beyond infection control, panels can really provide a great sound barrier and also a nice design element. So just something to consider. A few last things that you might want to consider in this area, especially given the open space, is you may want to orient the chairs parallel to the direction of airflow, or you may also consider placing multiple air purification uh, systems within this space. And the number is really gonna be determined on the way that the space lays out and also the square footage, which is something that Henry Schein can certainly help you with. Semi-private treatment rooms where a central cabinet may be used is a great way to make a space feel more open, as you can see here. However, if you want to add just an extra layer of protection, you can go ahead and add this header that's above the center island that just, um, it's just kind of a simple solution to prevent the spread of air cells going above and beyond into the next treatment room. If you want to take it one step further, you can also consider adding sliding doors for additional aerosol containment and also privacy as that you're seeing on this right side image. Close treatment rooms are where rooms are gonna be divided with full height walls. They're gonna offer the most protection. Um, as you can see here, we have a full height wall and we also have a wall behind this rear cabinet with dual cased openings. If you want, again, once, you know, add a little bit more extra privacy and take extra precautions, you can add some sliding doors that you see here in this image. Um, I think we've seen these sliding type barn doors for, for a few years now, they continue to trend. And they're really an easy solution, especially if you're looking to retrofit a space and you're just looking again for that extra layer of protection. 
In addition, we would also suggest placing air purification and aerosol containment um, at the foot end of the room. So uh, most often when we're laying out the treatment space here, you're gonna have one or two side cabinets and typically have room at the toe end here. Most often those units are going to be placed here. Um, if you're looking to build new, this is definitely something you should think about during the planning process, just to make sure you plan accordingly. Once again, if you wanna just take that extra step um, by adding here, if you take a look at this corner, you know, we've talked about these treatment rooms with the open entries, possibly adding some sliding doors. Here we took it a step further by adding two entries into this space. Um, so one, the idea is we could build in an isolation area if there was a sick patient that was needing treatment and we didn't want to bring them through the entire office. This is a great solution that they can enter directly into the room and then make an easy exit. And the great thing about this room too is it offers a little bit more space. We were able to take advantage of a dead end hallway. Um, so it may also be ideal for longer procedures. Sterilization, of course, has always been at the heart of the practice. This is a great opportunity to showcase your processes and also the special attention that you give to infection control. So as you can see in the image here, utilizing those divider panels, red and blue lights that identify clean to dirty, um, is really a great opportunity to share this with your patients. Create a visual into this space and it will really boost their patient that really boost the patient confidence and also reduce their anxiety that they may be feeling about their visit. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the private zone is going to accommodate all those staff spaces, including additional amenities. Although this, is, this area is often tucked out of sight of patients, uh, it's just important not to overlook this space. So taking a closer look, creating functional spaces within this private zone here, not only support infection control, but also provide amenities that support the staff team and build confidence with them. You wanna make sure that they're coming into a space every day that they feel welcome. Um, and this is a great way to do it by adding in some of those additional staff amenities. So just kind of taking a closer look at what we've planned for in here. First, let's just start by this main entry. We've created a separate entry and exit, um, not only for staff, but also for deliveries. So if anyone is coming in to drop off packages, they can simply come in this door and leave, this, leave them in this little nook we've created. Um, also, we've placed mechanicals and nitrous in this area for any cylinder deliveries or maintenance that's needed. They can simply come in this door, do what they need to and head out back through the door. Um, this really eliminates the need for bringing any additional people throughout the space. And you can also see too, we added another one of those sanitation stations. So just a great opportunity to remind people on their way in and out to wash their hands. Um, whether you put in one of those little stations or a little hand washing station here. Some additional amenities you might want to include would be a, a locker room or just some type of locker storage, um, along with potentially maybe a private changing room. The idea being is your staff is coming in, once again, wanting them to feel war you know, welcome in that space. We want to give them a little area to put their belongings. And then really depending on your, your processes, adding this changing room. So if they are putting scrubs, um, on when they get in and changing out of them before they leave, this is a great place to do that. Lastly, in this area, we've incorporated a laundry space. Um, I think that this has become a, a bigger topic given what, um, you know, what we've gone through in the past few months here. Um, we place laundry in this area. Uh, when you're building a new office, of course, it's really important to determine whether your laundry is going to be on site or off. Um, in this case, we've incorporated with the other staff areas. We've made it rather easy to change in and out of linens, um, creating a clean, or a clean linen storage and also a place to dispose of dirty linens. So as Renee mentioned earlier, we connected with our partners at CDI to provide some solutions that support the needs of today, but we wanna make sure that it offers flexibility in the future, of course. 
So within the staff lounge, we would really recommend creating some single stations that you're seeing here versus putting in a larger table. The great thing about these pieces, and again, I think that Renee showed some of these images earlier on in the waiting area, the booth seating that's really gotten popular. It's giving them a private space to work in. Um, but come, you know, later on in the future, if you should decide that you want to reconfigure this area and you want it to have more of a collaborative feel, we can simply turn these chairs around, join the tables, and now we've got a small grouping versus being tied into something based on what we're dealing with today. Once again, we want to make sure that we're always planning for the future. Shared staff spaces are, are really ideal when space is limited, which I, I think we often run into that. Um, so as we kind of take a look um, at these areas, once again, we, we tasked our furniture, or furniture dealership corporate design interiors. We asked them to take a look at the plan that we've developed and really come up with some solutions um, that would uh, work for these spaces. Um, and again, um, here, what you're seeing at the top and on this right side, here are three variations that you could incorporate into the private office space that we created. I would say that the, the image here in the upper right um, is a little bit more flexible um, and could be changed in the future. They've got, a mobile, um, they've got a mobile divider here. And once again, I think we saw that in the waiting area. Um, so if they were to decide in the future that they don't want this division, they can easily pull that out and use it elsewhere. The one on the right creates a little bit more of a permanent solution and I think is a really nice option for um, staff members that are gonna be spending a little bit more time in this space. If we take a look at this lower image with the dividers, I think this would really be ideal as a touchdown space. Um, space is gonna be limited, but we were able to add a long counter, add a few dividers, and really just give them a little privacy and also protection. And once again, if you take a closer look at these dividers, um, these are not mounted to anything. So if times change and you decide that you, you really just want an open counter um, and use these elsewhere, it really just gives more flexibility to the space. So with increased awareness to infection control, donning and doffing has quickly become a commonly used term. And if you haven't already heard it, um, it, it simply refers to the practice of putting on and taking off PPE. Um, it could also include clothing and uniforms. So as you can imagine, every office right now is trying to figure out what is best for them. And the approach to the subject is gonna be different. Um, our recommendation at this time would be to review these practices with your staff and, and determine what methods you really feel work best for you. I think, you know, as, as the year moves on and we move into 2021, uh, things continue to evolve. So as we're planning for the future, we want to make sure that we're taking into account what we're dealing with today, but also thinking about where we might be six months, 12 months from now. So the scenario that we put together when we were developing this space is we were definitely taking the downing and doffing into consideration, um, but making it somewhat of a flexible space. So we wanted to identify a few areas where those processes could happen, but we also wanted to make sure that we plan for the future. So once again, this, is, this has become a big topic. It continues to evolve, um, and it's just important to think about what your processes are today and what you expect in the future. So that kind of ties up just really looking at that top level view, the organization of the space, uh, the zoning and things to think about when it comes to space planning. Um, but now Renee's gonna kind of take us through a little bit more of the design elements, talk about the interior design and the, the finishes to consider. Renee? Awesome. Thank you, Jen. Um, so just a little background on Integrated Design Studio. Jen kind of touched briefly on all of our backgrounds and how many we have, designers we have. Um, but I would like to mention that Integrated Design Studio has been selecting dental office finishes for over 20 years. We have an array of service offerings that cover material selection. So this would be anything that really gets adhered to the building. So flooring, wall covering, paint, um, the list goes on as well as furniture, artwork, lighting, decor, and um, equipment finish selections. 
I'd like to point out that whether you are working with Integrated Design Studio or possibly a local design firm, it's really important to align yourself with a professional that has experience in either the dental or medical environment. Um, finishes, the color palette can really help combat that clinical sterile feel. You know, as a patient myself, I don't want to walk into a space that's going to give me more anxiety. So the use of the right finishes, the right color palette can really help ease one's mindset. Um, another key point is as a patient, you have, we talked about that first impression when they walk into that waiting room. It's important that that first impression continues on all the way till they exit your space. So creating consistency throughout your entire office. Um, and so these are some of the added advantages of working with a pro professional interior designer. So with this presentation, we really wanted to kind of zone in on the importance of work of when selecting material finishes for potentially a remodel of your existing space or building a new practice. It's critical to utilize commercial grade products. Um, Integrated Design Studio only specifies commercial grade products. Um, so what you might see at the larger box stores like Home Depot or Lowe's is not anything we ne necessarily would ever specify um, for a dental environment. The reason behind us only specifying commercial products is because they've been tested and proven over tons of testing methods um, for except exceptional cleanability and just long lasting durability. You know, right now with infection control, our, we're zoning in on being able to clean things or items or surfaces with rigorous um, medical grade cleaners. And so all these products have been tested, um, not just recently, but years prior. So we're going to kind of dive into some of what some of those commercial products are and how you can utilize them in your space. So the first type of material I want to focus on is flooring. Now, for the sake of this presentation, we're going to focus on majority of the most common um, popular types of flooring that we install. So I first want to talk about luxury vinyl tile or plank. Um, some of you may have utilized this product in your existing office. Um, some of you might be new and have never heard of it. Um, but Luxury Vinyl Tiler Plank comes in an array of different styles, sizes. Um, you can see over here on the far right, we have a wood look. Um, this is pretty common and typical. But we also have a ton of different options from the abstract to geometric to stone looks. Um, some of the benefits, not only from having a ton of different options on the design side, but it's a low maintenance product. There is no finishing necessary. Once it is installed, you're done, and it's just general cleaning after that. Um, all the commercial vendors provide guides, extensive cleaning guides, on which chemicals can be utilized on that flooring product, and a lot of them also offer their own cleaning products that can be purchased along with the flooring. You know, this is a product that is highly durable, um, not only in the dental environment, but these are products that are specified in hospitals, in airports, in schools. So it's a product that is not going to fail in a high traffic dental environment. Really, this is a product that we luxury vinyl tile um, or plank is something that we can recommend really throughout the entire space. Um, the only areas we typically don't recommend this would be in a wet room such as a restroom, um, but really you can see the list of recommendation areas that can work anywhere. So moving on to our next most common type of flooring is carpet tiles, and carpet tiles might be one of those things that you think, hmm, infection control carpeting might not be a great match. Well, unfortunately, what the good news is, is that on the commercial side, usually all the carpet tiles, um, again, have been tested to be bleach cleanable. Um, Different from a carpeting that we install in our homes, which comes in a large roll, a carpet tile's individual plank sizes. So if there is a carpet tile that is soiled beyond repair, it's a quick, easy fix to replace it if necessary. Um, one of the other major benefits is in design right now, whether it's in residential design or dental office design, open concept is still very popular. Um, but with open concept is the more noise is created, more sound pollution is created. So carpet tiles can really aid in sounding um, acoustics and, and sound absorption. From a design perspective, carpet tile is a great way to help define space. You might have a large waiting room, and as we talked about having those smaller furniture configurations, carpet tile can be used as a carpet tile inset to help divide that waiting room space up, or even wayfinding down that treatment corridor. Lastly, one of the great benefits is you and your staff are on your feet 
running back and forth to treatment to hygiene rooms all day. And carpet tiles have been proven to aid in um, less fatigue um, just because it's a softer product under your feet. Um, so areas that we have recommended, again, it's pretty much all of your waiting rooms, your business office consults, hallways, corridors, imaging alcoves, and kid areas. And just again, talking about from the design perspective, carpet tile is a great solution to incorporate your color palette, um, your design style, whether you're very modern or transitional. And I think these images over on the right can really showcase how they can really make a space very interesting. So moving from the floors to the walls, again, there is a ton of different products. I could probably spend hours talking about all the products that can get adhered to a wall, but I've been told to keep it short and sweet. So <laughs> our two most common um, wall treatments for in a dental environment would be paint. I think we're all pretty familiar with paint. Again, paint is one of those great solutions when you're looking to do a quick update. A, a painted wall can really add wow to a space. Um, you know, it's cleanable with mild detergents. There is a manufacturer that Integrated Design Studio is partnered with that does have a bleach cleanable paint. Right now, it's the only one in the market, but I do think with just given this, what's happening in the world right now, we're going to start seeing some of the other manufacturers coming out with a bleach cleanable paint. Um, the second most common is vinyl wall covering, or as it's known in the residential world, wallpaper. And I know when I say wallpaper, I can hear the cringes happening right now when I say that. We all have bad memories of a bad kitchen border or removing it ourselves. Um, however, in the commercial environment, especially in the dental environment, incorporating a vinyl wall covering can be a great solution. Um, number one, it comes with long-standing warranties. So once your paint is up, if it starts chipping, there is no warranty on that. Um, however, with a vinyl wall covering, if there are chips, there's dents or things like that, or um, if any finish starts coming off on that, the product is warrantied. Um, it's cleanable with mild detergents. Um, there's various thicknesses. So typically in the commercial dental environment, we specify a type two. Um, however, a type three can be used more for wall protection. So if you have crash carts or if you have mobile carts that you're worried about them banging into walls, that can be a great solution to help protect your walls. Um, Last two points on vinyl wall covering is they can disguise imperfect walls. You know, not every single wall is going to look great. Not every single finish that a drywaller does is going to look perfect. So that vinyl wall covering can really help um, minimize the look of imperfections. And lastly, the image over here on the right, um, this is a product by MDC. This is an example of just the options on the commercial wall covering side, and it's really beautiful. So we incorporate this in all different ways. Um, for accent pieces to a busy corridor that we know is gonna get a lot of wear and tear. So I think one of the types of materials that we get asked about a lot most recently um, is surfaces. You know, we've all been aware of cleaning our surfaces probably more than ever before, um, just given what the world is in right now. Um, and so we just wanted to create a quick chart and just kind of talk about some of the surfaces that we apply in a dental environment. So our first is laminate. Um, in, for an interior designer, we always specify a high pressure laminate, which is a lot different than the kind of laminates that you see on, let's say, materials or products from Target. Um, they're a lot thicker, they can handle more wear and tear. Um, again, some of the benefits of them is just they're very cost effective, um, consistent in color. We typically would specify this in the business office, private office, staff lounge, um, and even sometimes in patient waiting areas. If we have a high top table or beverage station, um, we typically will utilize laminates there. Solid surface, um, a lot of you may recognize solid surface with the coin term of Corian. Corian is actually a manufacturer that makes solid surface, and there's a ton of other vendors that make solid surface as well. This is a great, great surface um, for the dental environment. It is non-porous, no sealants are required. It's very consistent in color because it's a man-made product, highly durable and cost-effective. Um, typically, we will specify this in all treatment areas, labs, sterilization, sometimes even in restrooms if we're trying to do a nice apron front sink, and also in business office too. A lot of times we'll utilize that as a work surface. Um, and just to point, solid surfaces have come a long, long way in just style and color, um, so don't dismiss it. 
um, granite marble. This is not something I would really ever recommend um, in the dental office environment. So granite, as beautiful as it may be, um, is something that is going to require sealing. I know that there's sealants now that are five years, 10 years, but just with using heavier medical grade cleaners, I don't know how those sealants are going to hold up over the course of time. And marble is something I would never recommend in any type of commercial setting. However, if you like the look of granite and marble, you're in luck because quartz, which is another man-made product, um, as you can see, really hits the nail on all these, all these points um, that we're trying to hit. And there are marble looks, career marble looks, more natural stone looks like a granite. Um, and we really specify this in all different areas of the office, from the business office to beverage stations, treatment areas, restrooms, sterilization. So moving away from kind of our public zone areas and those finishes um, and moving into that dental treatment room, um, you know, when, when speaking of infection control, one thing we would recommend is consider going with a seamless um, chair model instead of a stitched upholstery. This again, anytime you're limiting those stitches and those seams can really um, help eliminate where germs are gonna live and grow. So Jen and I have been talking a lot about furniture on this presentation and how to use furniture in your space to help um, with infection control. And, you know, there is a ton of options out there for furniture. And we in this presentation feel that, you know, commercial furniture is really the best bet with infection control. And just some of the benefits, just, just to hit on, um, are the long lasting warranties that are included. Um, all commercial furniture has been tested for stability, durability, weight bearing properties. I think you've seen that there's a lot of versatility from your waiting room to your staff lounge to your private office spaces. Um, in addition, all the fabric that get applied to commercial um, furniture are also typically bleach cleanable, and you can even specify a moisture barrier on them as well. So I love this slide because I feel like this has been our lives for a while now, um, and we all had to make quick solutions um, to reopen your practice or for stores to reopen, and those quick solutions were necessary. However, I think it's time that we start thinking about some long-term solutions. You know, we talked about that first impression, as you see at this market, unfortunately, my daughter's pediatric office still has this up. Um, and it's not a very warm or welcoming feeling, not only for the parents, but also for the children that are being seen. Um, you know, these precautions are necessary right now. I think they will be here to stay. Um, so really investing in something that looks nice, that works well, um, really, again, helps with patient confidence and your staff's confidence. Um, so let's look at some um, solutions that you could invest in. So again, working with our commercial furniture dealer, again, they have over access to over 200 lines of furniture vendors. So the sky's the limit when it really comes to these partitions. But we just wanted to showcase a couple of different options. Um, just some basic mounting options that are available. Um, so this is actually, we're showcasing two different products here. Um, one is human scale and one is MDC Zintra. Um, on the top pictures, we see just again, there's fixed in place. So we kind of looked at that earlier with the two different waiting room layouts, freestanding, which again offers you ultimate flexibility and then the full surround. Um, you know, you gotta select a mounting style that's gonna work best for you. Um, there's also a ton of different materials out there. So from heavy duty acrylics to glass to a new product that's just come out called PTEG, which is a plastic resin, and then Zintra, which you can see below, um, which is like the felt like looking product. And this is actually a really cool product and we're gonna take a look at that in a little bit, but it is bleach cleanable um, and has antimicrobial properties, even though it is a fabric instead of a glass or acrylic. So as I mentioned before, a product called Zintra that has antimicrobial properties, I just kind of wanted to wrap this interiors portion up with just some products to leave you inspired. Um, you know, when speaking with infection control, it can be a drab subject, but I just wanted to kind of showcase, or we wanted to showcase here, how it doesn't have to be drab. It can be fun. It can be exciting. You can in incorporate these into your design. Um, so the first image over on the right are MDC Zintra panels. So these, again, are those antimicrobial panels. And here they're being utilized um, as divider panels in the ortho bay. Again, um, you know, it just is really as a fun aesthetic, um, but it's still creating patient privacy. It's helping with some of those aerosols by not having it be fully opened. 
The image on the right is a new product that they just launched um, this summer, and they are movable divider panels. So again, when we're trying to create quick solutions for an existing waiting room to divide up space, this might be a good solution. This is a brand new product by the same manufacturer, MDC. This is called Funk. Um, and they are pretty funky, in my opinion. Um, the first one on the left is a movable partition. Again, they're just really cool, something different, something fun. The one in the middle um, is a floor to ceiling insulation. So this would probably typically use aircraft cabling from the ceiling and then be mounted on the floor. But it's just a really cool way to divide space without feeling like an actual division. Um, the loft wall partition, so we showcased this in um, a couple different solutions from the um, waiting room solution where we retrofitted the space to the private office space. So this again is a movable divider. Um, they're available in all different colors and styles and sizes. And the last two images are a product called LumaCore. And actually a lot of the dental manufacturers have standardized this within their cabinets. And this image, the first image is on the bottom showcases just a way that LumaCore can be used to not necessarily provide that divider between patient and greeter, but possibly utilize as a divider between a semi-private checkout station and regular checkout station, or trying to divide any other space where you might have multiple staff members seating. And again, they offer a ton of different design solutions from um, how they can be installed to the overall look and pattern. All right. Well, thanks so much, Renee. That was really great information. Um, before we finish up today, I just really want to re reiterate some key takeaways from today's presentation. Uh, once again, the information provided today is for consideration and really intended as a guide to designing a functional space with infection control in mind. The restrictions we are currently experiencing will not last forever. While it's important to adjust for the times, it's, it's just as important to plan for the future. So I will leave you with a few reliable resources out there, including our own Henry Schein Resource Center. We really encourage you to be informed, take advantage, or take advantage of everything that is out there on this subject. And of course, uh, Henry Schein Integrated Design, we're also here as a support. So thanks again for joining us today. Um, back to you, Adam. All right. Thank you both for your presentation. We've got about 10 minutes left for questions. So if anyone does have questions, Questions, type them into the chat or Q&A and we'll get to them as time allows. First question, do you have any recommendations for staff traffic patterns in addition to the patient flow that you shared? Uh, that's a, it's a, a great question and I, and I think while um, we were all kind of working through this process and thinking about that patient flow, um, we were also thinking about how we could demonstrate that with staff. Um, but we were also kind of trying to narrow some things down. So I think just kind of focusing on that staff path of travel, almost kind of that opposite take that you saw from that patient experience, um, thinking about where that entry was on the left side of the space, staff is coming in that exit or that exit or that entry side door um, with the idea once they enter, they're going to they're gonna wash their hands and sanitize. They're going to step into the locker space. Um, they're going to change if they need to, tuck away their belongings, um, and then head out into the treatment space. And where they go from there, I think is really dependent on the, the practice. So um, we talked about donning and doffing, where we're going to um, put on PPE, where we're taking it off. Um, if there's going to be treatments that are gonna be high producing aerosols, most often um, there's probably an extra layer of PPE PPE that is being disposed of in the room. Um, and so I think when we started looking at that staff pattern, it is really dependent on those processes. So to, to kind of just close it up, coming in that left door, thinking about where they're going to be putting on their scrubs, additional PPE, heading out to the treatment space. And again, you saw that circulation around the sterilization area and the flow back into the staff area. Mm -hmm. Great. And for those of you asking, this presentation will be available after the fact. We are recording it, so everyone will get a link of the recording, and we will also be sending out the slides of the presentation as well. 
What is the number one recommendation that you would make when trying to retrofit an office? Renee, I'll let you take that one. I would keep the retrofitting or remodeling to, I guess, well, it really depends on what you need to retrofit, right? So that's a loaded question. Um, there's a lot of different ways we could answer that. I think, you know, for quick fixes, um, budget-friendly remodels, you know, adding, updating paint, updating decorative lighting, um, maybe updating some flooring in your waiting room and keeping a lot of those updates to patient-centric areas. You know, for total rehauls, um, I think it's really important to start working with the designer and contractor early in that process to figure figure out, A, how am I going to stay in practice while this remodel happens? Where am I going to get the most bang for my buck? And again, I really do believe that investing in those patient-centric areas is going to get you the best investment in return. Um, you know, but working with a contractor early on to figure out how that phasing approach can happen. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything, if I have more to answer for that question. You know, and I think quick fixes, like updating, you know, your decorative lighting, incorporating artwork, updating the paint colors, um, those are things that can easily happen in a, a weekend or two that don't require you to shut down. Um, but if you're looking to do a total overhaul, connecting with the designer and contractor early on in that process is probably critical. Do you have a recommendation for how to handle a kid's area? in terms of separation, distancing, anything else that comes to mind? So there's a lot of furniture options that actually can kind of provide enclosing a space without fully enclosing it. I think incorporating, you know, physical walls, um, maybe even utilizing some glass um, so that parents or staff can see in. Um, you know, I think it would take an evaluation of your space to kind of figure out what the best approach is. But, um, you know, we have an array of furniture that even have really super high back walls where you can add a um, high top table over the top so parents can still see in but those kids are kind of sectioned off from the remainder of the waiting room. You know, obviously adding a physical wall is going to completely separate them, um, but you might want to do that physical wall in glass so that you still have visibility in. Well, and just, I guess, just to add a little bit onto what Renee said, I mean, I think there's a lot of different furniture solutions, but I would also circle back and think about some of those solutions um, for adults as well, is I think kids' areas have really changed. You know, I think about the same example that Renee mentioned, um, going to the doctor's office with her daughter, I had the same experience, everything was saran wrapped. Um, and all those little play stations, all those different areas for kids to keep them occupied before their appointment um, have really gone away. Um, I don't know when we'll see them again. Um, so maybe incorporating individual interactive spaces that maybe, maybe takes them out of that main area. Patients can still monitor them, but it creates more of an ind individual space. Um, I, I think anything, if kids are touching things that you want to be able to keep an eye you know, an eye on the waiting room and be able to sanitize those things on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Just another thing to keep in mind. Excellent points. Um, let's see, we have a scenario question here. At present, our office does not allow anyone to wait in the waiting rooms, whether rather wait in the cars prior to coming into the office. From an economic production standpoint, it makes sense to remove the waiting room from the design but you've recommended keeping it because it's a first impression of the practice. Is there a consensus on this? I, I mean, John, do you, you want to go or do you? Um, I mean, I can, I can start and I'll let you um, okay. come on to it. Um, I think it really depends um, on the, the practice, whether we're talking about retrofitting, if we're building new, um, you know, if, if we're really expecting that this is going to be a long-term solution, um, you may look at maybe minimizing that area, but I still, I, I still feel like any place that you, you walk into, still having a, a friendly face, um, either way, you're still going to need a business space for your staff to work at, working on records, so we're still going to need that piece. So maybe you, you still use that as an opportunity that maybe they're not directly working or um, maybe they're not directly checking patients in, but they still have that visibility and um, monitoring. And then as things shift, 
um, we've created a space that um, works for now and also in the future. Renee, I don't know if you have anything else you want yeah, to Yeah, and I was, well, and you know, I, I'm, we recommended the one and a half to two chairs for operatory. Um, you know, that's been a recommendation for a long time. I do see a trend of smaller waiting rooms, you know, just with square footage being a premium in the dental office, um, you know, reducing the size of those waiting rooms. But I still think it's critical to still have somewhere for someone to sit because I hope, mm -hmm. and we all hope in time that we get out of the state of that we're in. And the worst thing you could do is completely remove that. And then the expectation eventually comes back to having an actual waiting room or having a greeter um, to be able to check in. So I think, you know, it's, it's hard to say right now. I think, like Jen said, maybe move, removing some, a little bit of space, but still having enough for a greeter and a couple chairs makes sense. And, you know, maybe if you have a grandiose waiting room, maybe that's reduced down in size. Great. When you guys talk about furniture and like for the waiting room or even the um, operatories, how would one go about choosing that furniture, buying that furniture, would they go through you? Do you mm -hmm. recommend manufacturers? How does that work? Yeah. So with our partnership with CDI, um, they, we, um, we work together with them. So if you're interested in purchasing furniture, um, you would work with one of our interior designers, whether it's me or the others that are um, on our team. Um, we would consult with CDI to ensure that you're getting everything that you need, and then you would purchase directly through CDI. Um, from that purchase, they would then facilitate with the local installation team in your area to house the product until you're ready for it to be installed, come out and install it, and then handle any punch list items that might happen after installation. Great, and it looks like we have one last question here. Are there any CDC recommendations that you know of for room turnover rates for asymptomatic and or symptomatic patients? What about any, what about any input or advice on direction of airflow to minimize shared risks? I think when you talk about airflow, I mean, that's something that you want to talk about early on with your contractor and your architect. Um, a lot of what comes into play is the HVAC system. Um, so it's definitely an important conversation. Um, I think our team does not personally get involved in specifying that, but we also want to make sure that we're taking into account any re you know, additional requirements for the building. So I, I think it would really kind of be a joint effort um, and the way that our team works, I mean, we're working very closely with the equipment specialist who, who really help coordinate that entire process. You know, they almost act as a, a project manager that will help connect to architects, contractors. Um, so we're all very closely connected to make sure we're on the same page and that the project flows rather smoothly. So. Great. Well, that'll do it for us tonight. I want to thank Jen and Renee for their presentation and thank all of you for joining us tonight. If we were unable to answer your question or if you think of a question, please feel free to email us at webinars at henryshine.com or you can email integrated design at henryshine.com as well. Everyone in attendance will receive a link of the recording in the coming week via email. On behalf of Henry Shine, thanks again for joining us and everyone have a great night.